Hey, everybody, and welcome to another Learning Statistics with Jamovi video. Oh, boy, it's been a while since the last video, mainly because my 2022 summer has been hectic. So I haven't had time to record any new videos. But I wanted to finish the Learning Statistics with Jamovi this uh, this summer. So, you know, in 2022, so we can move on next year as, you know, the uh, software gets updated and is constantly, you know, changing and adding features because I think that'll be better. And we'll I'll probably go back and update some older videos, that kind of thing. I do as well have another video series coming out as well before, you know, the semester begins. So that is my goal is to get that other video series out. I mentioned it uh, a couple of months ago. This was going to be how to write little result sections. There's, it's not going to be crazy. It's just going to be doing that. OK, so enough of that out of the way. Apologies for the delay. If you are watching this in real time and you're like, where are his other videos? So let's jump in with this video's topic. This video's topic is going to be on multiple regression, multiple regression. So that is the general linear model, and we are going to be making some lines. So I'll do a quick, we'll say uh, a bivariate regression using the simple, uh, re the just the linear regression module here in the in the analyses bar, and then we'll do a multiple, a, a regular multiple regression with at least two or three. Uh, predictors for one dependent variable. And then in another video, we'll do a hierarchical regression in Jamovi so you can see how adding or subtracting, mainly adding predictors to an existing model will help you determine if there's a significant change in R squared, because that's really the, the goal here. So there's gonna be two separate videos. I don't wanna make this one too long. We're just gonna do simple multiple regression or a one single bivariate, which is just one X variable and one Y variable. And then we'll do a simultaneous or simple multiple regression with multiple x variables. Okay, so let's find some data first. Uh, like I have been doing in these videos is I have been using the um, data library and or the learning statistics with Jamovi from Navarro and Foxcroft uh, data sets from their text from their, you know, free textbook. So definitely take a take a look at their uh, their work there. And so we'll grab a data file from there again to get their the learning statistics with Jamovi, the LSJ data, you do have to go up to modules and you have to manage your installed modules. So um, I have not updated all of my modules, so ignore that, but you're looking for the LSJ, um, which is just a set of, I think I scrolled too fast. Did here somewhere. I'm pretty sure our, once you once you have it installed, there's really nothing else to do with it. Um, there's, oh, there it is. Yeah, so they're not updating it because they haven't updated the book, but Navarro and Foxcroft, Daniel Navarro and David Foxcroft um, put this these data sets together and they aren't actual modules that are using different things. So they don't have to get updated, which is good. Keeps my Jamovi clean and I will eventually go and update those all. All right, so let's grab one of those data sets. So we're gonna go to open, hamburger menu, open, and we're gonna go to learning statistics with Jamovi here. And then because this is all color coded and categorized, we just need to look for our, uh, you know, our regression. So we have parenthood, which has this blue regression model. And I think we'll just use parenthood, sleep and mood data um, for both of the regressions. So we're just going to use the single data set for the both kinds of regressions that I want to do. And we'll likely use parenthood for our hierarchical one as well. So for the next video. All right. So let's click on that. It opens it up for us. Okay, so I'm going to pull this. Oh, I guess we didn't need to pull it. So we have our uh, participant ID. Well, technically, I think this is like a day. Um, because it corresponds with day. So you can use ID and day interchangeably from what I can tell, because this is a single case study set of data. So this is not multiple people, but multiple days where we are tracking how much sleep Dan, our parent, Dan is our parent, and his baby gets sleep. So Dan sleep, let's say uh, fractions of hours. So the whole number is hours, and then we have fractions of hours. So we have eight hours or 7.35, which is about 20 minutes, okay? So seven hours and 20 minutes. And then we have baby sleep, which you you will see is, I believe this baby data um, is, I think this is fictional, but in any case, it's an infant because we see, you can see that this baby is sleeping almost 12 hours. And if you've had an infant or know how infants sleep, then you're probably aware that they need to sleep many times a day. The other um, piece of information that we get from this set of data is Dan Grump. Dan Grump. So this is Dan's level of grumpiness the, of the day. And I believe it is on a scale from zero to uh, zero to 100. Um, many of these numbers are quite high. Many of these numbers are above 50. So I'm not entirely sure um, the amount of Dan Grump that we should be paying attention to. But let's just go with higher numbers means uh, more grumpiness. And so you could probably imagine that the least amount of sleep that Dan gets leads to Dan Grump. So let's do that. Let's ignore the baby for a second. Of course, we're we can't really ignore the baby because the amount of sleep the baby gets really does impact the amount of sleep that Dan gets. Right. But let's save that for a minute and let's try to predict how much grumpiness that Dan gets or has, I suppose, versus his level of sleep. Right. So you can make your own predictions there. You can probably bet that the, the less amount of sleep that he gets, the higher his grumpiness level will be. 
And that's going to be a negative relationship, right? Because as this number goes down, this number goes up. So we should expect a negative relationship here. So we could go to a correlation matrix and just compare the two. But let's do this as a prediction, right? Let's see if this model is a little bit better than just a correlation. Of course, there are pretty much the same structure. You just get a little bit more information from the linear regression than just doing a correlation matrix. So we only get really correlation, uh, Pearson's R and a P value for correlation matrix uh, in a bivariate. With linear regression, we can actually get the intercept of this uh, relationship. So if X is zero, how much, <laughs> how much, if, if Dan gets no sleep, what's going to be his level of grumpiness, right? So theoretical level of grumpiness, maybe it's 100, you know, we'll find out. So, uh, and then we get how much of a, uh, hour decrement or or for every hour less of sleep how much grumpiness does it grow so we get a little bit more information from doing a regression than just by doing a correlation and so this is interesting because if you want to try to predict how much how grumpy dan will be based on his amount of sleep it's like uh his wife or partner who wakes up um in the morning and is like oh dan how much how much sleep did you get today and he says six hours well what's that what's that going to be related to grumpiness. So she kind of has an idea. That's what the prediction's for. That's why we, we, we would do a linear regression instead of just a correlation. Okay. Because we'll get the correlation and all of this extra data. So we're going to do Dan Grump as the dependent variable and Dan Sleep as the covariate. Now, you can see here that covariates and factors are situate, are, are separated, not situated, are separated. So what the, um, I, I don't think this really matters, but for organizational purposes, covariates are your uh, scale variables, so things that are continuous, and then your factors are your ordinal or nominal, and they that, this way they can get dummy coded if they needed to. Okay, so definitely make sure you're putting your variables in the right places. And as you can see, it's asking for a scale variable for the dependent variable, but Dan Grump is only a nominal variable in um, in the program reading it, of course, because they're integers, and so it thinks that they're distinct integers. But that's okay. Level of grumpiness on this scale can be seen as continuous. So that's why it's allowing it. All right, we don't need, we don't have any weights. So there's no weighted uh, on this. Um, and that is because day is just a count uh, from one to however many data sets that we have, or however, whatever our n is. And you can see it already populates some of the default items selected, but let's go through this model builder. Um, we will come back to this model builder when we do our hierarchical reg regression. But um, so we'll come back to that. So I'm gonna skip that in this video because if you're doing a bivariate or a multivariate, which we'll do next, then um, we will, uh, we will, uh, we won't be using this. So we're going to skip this. Okay. So um, we also don't need reference levels because we don't have anything that's being dummy coded. Uh, assumption checks definitely want to get assumption checks. So we want to see if um, these two things are measuring the same thing, Dan Sleep and Dan Grump. So that's the autocorrelation test. Okay. We want to get our collinearity statistics. So VIF and tolerance. Okay. Our normality test for our um, uh, DV. Okay. That's the shapiro wilk test. And you can get a QQ plot of residuals if you want to, or you can get the full residual plots. And then the data summary, we only have two variables. Uh, Cook's distance isn't going to be much helpful for us. So those are our major assumption checks that we want to get, autocorrelation, collinearity, and normality. Let's, before we move on, let's double check all of these. VIF and tolerance are both one on Dan's sleep, which is our covariates, which is fine. We don't need to worry about those because they are one. The, uh, the lower you get from one, so one is the highest, and so we have proportion values, 0 0.98, 0 0.99, you know, all the way down to zero. And same thing with VIF. The farther away they get from one, the worse your collinearity is. Now, if we look at the Durbin-Watson test for autocorrelation, our autocorrelation is 0 .07, 0 .07, 0 0.0706, and that statistic is 2.12, which means that our p-value is uh, very, very high. And again, with violations of assumptions, these p-values need to be very low. So they need to be extreme p-values, very, 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 very small for us to have to worry about autocorrelation. This is a very small value. It's not 0.99. You can imagine if this was like 0.8 or 0.9, then we'd have problems. Normality, um, we have our statistic is close to our Shapiro-Wilk um, is close to one. So we are doing fine there. So our assumptions are all good. Model fit. All right. So model fit, we get our multiple R and our multiple R squared. That's why there's capital here. So that stands for multiple R, lowercase r is just a single R value. But of course, we only have one covariate. So um, little r and big R are the exact same. Same thing with multiple R squared. Little r squared, coefficient of determination, and multiple R squared, or the multiple co coefficient of determination, are the exact same in this case. This will not be true if we had more than one X variable. But for now, those are the exactly equal. So we have an R of 0.903. And if you take the, if you square that, we get a smaller number, which is 0.816. The higher these numbers, or the closer they are to one, the better model fit you have, both as R, the correlation between the two variables, as well as R squared, which is the how much explanation Dan's sleep is to Dan Grump. So 82% of the variance in Dan's sleep 
is explained by, or excuse me, uh, the other way around. 81, 82% of the variance in Dan Grump is explained by the variance in Dan Sleep. Look at that. And then we have our coefficients, okay, which are right here, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, now you can get additional um, fit measures if you want to. You can get the adjusted R squared, which is a, uh, a bias correction. And you can see that here we don't have a lot of biasing information because our, our statistics are all good here. So right here, it's only 0 0.002 adjusted. So that's not bad. You can get the AIC and the BIC, which are additional fit indices. Okay. And then the root mean square error, which is also a fit indice if you've been doing uh, SEM, such structural equation modeling, or um, factor analysis, the RMSE is really good. So this is the root mean square error. Okay. We can also get the overall model fit. So this is testing the R squared to zero. Okay. And so our F is 435. It doesn't even have any decimal points. Okay. So you can imagine that this P value is very, 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 very small. <laughs> um, so that's not really going to help us too much here. So we're going to um, collapse that and we're going to go to model coefficients. We can get the omnibus ANOVA test, which is the test of the, the, pretty much the same thing, R squared. So it's basically taking this overall model test and putting it down here and giving you slightly more information about the mean square and the mean square error. F is still 435. And so the P is points less than 0 0.001. Okay, we can get our confidence intervals for our uh, estimates. This is always good. And then standardized estimates to get our beta. Beta is useful when you have a lot of uh, predictors, you know, two or more predictors. So you definitely want to get your standard estimates so you can compare them because you cannot directly compare. If I had more, I'll talk about this. Can't directly compare um, these two together. And then of course, getting confidence intervals for everything is always good. So I always add those regardless if I need them or not. And I leave them at 95%. We can also get our estimated marginal means. So we can drag dance, dance leap here and it will give us a graph as well as the table if we want to. Now on the graph, this is really fun. This, uh, uh, this shaded area is the confidence intervals around each of these um, point values of dance sleep, right? So going from five hours up to nine hours, and then on this scale here, do not recreate this. This is not an APA uh, test. I mean, you would want to start with zero and go to 10 on the amount of hours of dance sleep. As far as Dan grumpiness, of course, we would want to make sure that we have the full scale on here as well. Now our values don't go below 40 and don't go above 80 too much. I think there are some 90, maybe there's a 90 in there. I'm not entirely sure, but in any case, this is just to indicate the slope of the line and the confidence intervals around the line itself. And then here we have the mean, and then we get a minus one standard deviation and a plus one standard deviation, which allows us to plot this, right? So it will give us um, what the marginal mean is, the standard error of that, and then the lower and upper bounds on that. That's the last one for there because save, now you can uh, save predicted values and it will add a predicted values column on the side. You can see how close the prediction is to the actual observed value, which I think is fun. Um, let's click on this one again. You can save your re residuals and then you can save your cooks distances if you want. Each three of these will add a column, a separate column to your to your data file, okay? And then if you save the data file, it will save those as part of the new data file. Okay, let's go through this really quickly. I'm sure you can see that um, predicting gr Dan's grumpiness level from his sleep is pretty accurate. Um, so and it is in a negative value. So for every hour less of Dan's sleep or in any, or in this case, since it's negative, let me, so I'm not speaking in knots. So for each value of Dan's sleep, his grumpiness level drops nearly nine points. So the least amount, the less amount of sleep he gets, the more grumpy he is. That's pretty, pretty clear there. Um, the T value is minus 20.9. And so you can imagine that that P value is very, very small. Now, 20.9 and 435 are related to one another. And you can see that these values are very, very extreme. That is to say, the, least, the, the less amount of sleep that Dan gets, the more grumpy he is. Oh, no, the more sleep Dan gets, the less grumpy he is. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, let's move some stuff around, shall we? Let's move some stuff around. Can we predict for our next, for my next trick, let's do a linear regression where we are going to predict the amount of Dan sleep from the amount of baby sleep. We'll see if that correlates and the amount of grumpiness. So we're going to go, we're going to go backwards with the grumpiness now. And we're going to do both of these together for a truly multiple regression. Uh, so this is two or more predictors and boom. There we go. OK, so we're going to do that and we are going to grab all of the things that I did on the last one. OK, I'm not really going to explain them again, but you can see from our model builder that both of these are in block one. So this is a simultaneous regression. We are going to get our additional things because why not? You know, never, never too late to get all of these. And then we definitely want our standardized estimates because grumpiness and hours of sleep for the baby are in two different, two different scales. So to be able to compare them directly is important. So we want to be able to go, oh, OK in standard units. Okay. And then let's get our, um, let's get our 
we're going to add a new term to get Dan Grump in there as well. So we get a couple of plots of that. And let's just get our tables too. So those are our, our uh, things. So the amount of sleep the baby gets, the amount of sleep increases for Dan. So as they increase, so they are positively correlated. And then we already know about grumpiness level and sleep levels that is negatively correlated. And so we have our plots here. Okay, so let's go through. Let's look at our assumption checks. I kind of wish these were up at the top, but you know, I don't. I don't make the ordering here. So autocorrelation, um, not too bad. This is all three of them comparing to one another. P is 0.32, no violation. Now. VIF and tolerance. So we got farther away from uh, one. We're getting farther away from one here. So they're both the same value. So it's important to note that our VIF and tolerance are not as good as when uh, or with baby sleep in this as another predictor than what we had up here. One and one. And then our Shapiro Wilk test, not too bad. Uh, we've got a statistic of 0.99 and a p value of 0.73. No violation. So let's take a look. Our R is 0.914 compared to um, our other one of 0 0.990. OK, so this model explains slightly, slightly more variance in the um, amount of sleep that Dan gets, which means our R squared is 0.84, rounding 0 0.836, 0 0.84. And so we've got a overall model that is significant. If we break it out by uh, baby sleep and grumpy, Dan's grumpiness, we can see that both predictors are significant. And if we come down here, we can see that that's true by looking at our estimates and their, and their t-tests, that even the estimate or the intercept, excuse me, um, is significant. OK, so. If we look at baby sleep, um, for every hour of sleep the baby gets, Dan gets an extra 0.1 hour, 0.1 hour, six minutes, <laughs> six minutes. For every hour of baby sleep, Dan gets six minutes. Mm, that feels so good. As a dad myself, oh man, I remember those days, an extra six minutes. -wee! And we've already established that um, Dan um, is less grumpy when he gets more sleep. So for every uh, value uh, of grumpiness decreases, uh, again, uh, Dan loses about, a, uh, it means that Dan did not get six minutes of sleep, right? Because these values are pretty close to one another, okay? These values are pretty close. Now, when we look at the standard estimates, however, we can say that actually what contributes to Dan's lack of sleep is not, uh, is not the baby so much, but really his grumpiness level. Or that is to say, what explains his amount of sleep better it's his grumpiness, right? So his observed grumpiness, we can predict the amount of sleep he gets far better than we can predict the amount of sleep that he gets based on the baby's total sleep time, okay? Because that's a positive point, uh, point 0.172, while this is a negative point zero, uh, 806, point 0.806. So far better estimate um, and a far better explanation of his amount of sleep. It's a bit of a goofy example, but that's, that's how you do that. So that is a bivariate regression in Jamovi, and that is this is a multivariate regression in Jamovi. If you have any comments, questions, feedback, please leave those in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.